few uh, sort of introductory things. The first is that we are recording this, so anyone who's not available to be online will be able to watch it asynchronously as many times as they want to later. And uh, for the families, if you want to post this on the website or the Facebook page or whatever, that's great. Um, we want to make sure it's available both for new families that join, families that couldn't join, providers, educators, anyone else this is useful for. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Wendy Chung. Um, I'm very happy to see some familiar faces out there, um, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm a medical geneticist at Columbia University, and um, we described um, one of the first patients with FIP. And I want to give credit um, Kirsten Craddock, who's um, actually, she's logged in under Anna Kim. Um, for those of you who see her on her screen, she's not Anna, she's actually Kirsten, and uh, she's waving. Um, She's a fabulous medical student at Columbia, and she's really um, been very helpful in terms of corralling everything together. I know many of you have talked with her on the phone or sent her medical records, um, and she's done an incredible job. And so uh, even though I'm going to be talking about some of this, I really want to give credit to Kirsten. She's the one who's done the hard work of pulling it all together, and she may have specific things to chime in with um, that I either overlook or she wants to give some added color to. So just a, a shout out to Kirsten. She also has been uh, the technical person that's making this all possible so that we don't have wonky sounds in the background and we can see the slides and all that. So that's no small feat. Um, so anyway, thanks, Kirsten. Um, I was hoping actually that we'd have some colleagues joining from Europe and I think they may still be, but we'll see. Um, so for those of you who have a PubMed alert or have been watching what's going on in the medical literature, um, just in 2018, there's been a very nice series that's come out of Bert DeVries group, um, and Sandra is his um, trainee who's done a lot of that work. Um, okay, so just to warn you that if we, um, if we end up with a feedback loop, we'll end up with echo like that. So, so that's why Kirsten may have muted folks, not because we don't want to hear from you, but um, just to try and avoid that. So I'm hoping they're going to join us later. Um, Anyway, they were going to be able to present some of their data, um, and as you'll see from the numbers, uh, this is still an evolving story, and so we're going to give you up-to-date information, but it's for sure not the last word in this. Um, the other Wendy, thing that I just want to... Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? We, we are there. Oh, very good. <laughs> oh, very good, <laughs> no, Sandra. Yeah, and I think I saw okay, Lisa that good. the participants... Uh, uh, too. Very good. So I, I think we're both there, so you know. <laughs> Wonderful. So, Sandra, I think you can now see her, hopefully, at the bottom of your screen of faces. Um, Sandra, what I was going to do is we'll uh, show some of our work, and then if it's okay, then we'll switch and make you presenter mode, and you can show the work that you're going to be showing. Yes, that's sure. fine. Yeah. Yes, thank okay, you. Okay, very good. Excellent. I'm so glad you could join. Um, so, uh, we also have many families who are online, and the other thing we're going to do is at the end of the presentation, we're going to keep the line open because it may be an opportunity just for you all to talk and compare notes. Uh, you don't have to, uh, but we're keeping the line open for a total of two hours, so probably we'll finish in the first hour and then you can keep the line open as much as you like for the second hour. Um, we're going to drop off the line so we won't hear or understand anything you're talking about. We won't record at that point, so it's all confidential information. Um, and if you don't use much time at that time, but we just thought it might be helpful to you all. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and get going. Kirsten's going to be advancing the slides, and um, certain times, Kirsten, if it's okay, I'll have you point to things on the slides. Okay, so we'll go ahead. We can advance. Okay, so there it is. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about a lot of the molecular biology behind this, um, but for some of you that are inquisitive and interested, um, this is interesting in that it's, um, we think of it as a single gene, but it actually encodes three different proteins. I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail, but one of the messages that I do want to drive home for all the families out there, and you'll see this in a second, is each individual that we have in the community really is in many ways unique and has interesting things to contribute um, to hopefully understanding this as a whole. Some of this complexity comes in the form of, as I said, there are different protein products that come from one gene. And depending on where the genetic change is in your family, it may affect all three or perhaps even just one of the proteins. 
Um, and there's, as you'll see, some variability between individuals, and we're trying to understand that variability, uh, both in terms of being able to not give the best guidance to your families about, you know, what to watch for, what to be more or less concerned about, um, and also to think about someday what we might do in terms of treatment or support. Fundamentally, as the way I think about this, um, this gene is involved in what we call a ubiquitin ligase uh, system. I, I don't worry that you think about what that is, but it helps to decide what proteins should be degraded or which proteins are ready to get turned over. And so it's important really in, in coordination of many different processes. Um, when we think about where in the body it probably has its greatest impact, um, and you'll see this from the symptoms, I think it's primarily in the brain. Uh, but also to a certain extent within the pancreas and within muscle cells. And so as we talk about some of the symptoms, I think that also overlaps with where we see most of the symptoms in the children or the individuals. Um, but again, this is meant to be an open dialogue and discussion. I don't pretend that we know all of these answers yet. Next slide, Kristen. Um, so this is just to give you a visualization of the different proteins that are produced from the same gene. Um, and Kristen, maybe you can show on the, on the top one is the, the largest sort of all-encompassing FIP1. And then you don't need to worry about the exact process, but there are two other genes that can be produced from the same sort of parent gene, so NRDP as well as FIP. And again, I'm not going to go over it because I don't think it's really so important that you focus on this. Um, but there are different regions that we know about the gene that probably have slightly different functions and give us some insights into where some of the problems go wrong. And we've shown these just schematically as these different blocks with these different colors. Um, the important thing, and, and you'll see this in just a second, is that, again, there's overlap between these, but they're not exactly the same. And so um, some of the changes, as I said, will affect um, all three of the proteins, um, only really one of them, um, some two out of the three, um, but there can be differences. Next slide. So this condition is relatively new. Um, we knew about the first case in 2012, but it really, I don't think, was recognized by the medical community. Um, since then, there have been, at least to my knowledge, three additional reports in the literature that have put together a series of cases. Um, and I think our goal is to try and continue to share that information. Uh, we do try and publish it both in the medical literature, and I hope someday we'll be able to do it in something called Gene Reviews, which is an online resource um, that makes information readily available to doctors and in a way that's relatively um, easily accessible. So, you know, sort of high-level summary with references to important details, but that way when you go into the doctor's office, uh, for your family member, they're able to very quickly look this up and see the latest information because we update this on an annual basis. And they're able to look at, for instance, what screening should I be doing? Um, you know, if I'm thinking about growth, what's appropriate growth to be able to think of for my individual, um, for my patient with it. Um, but this is something, the point being that it's a way to disseminate information in one common place and keep it up to date. Next slide. Um, the one other thing, I, uh, just before the person, that's fine, you don't have to go back. Um, but the one thing I'll bring out here is that the number of individuals, while it's much larger than it was even a year or two ago, um, is still very small to, to my mind. So I think there's still a lot to learn. And so just to be careful, um, I, I don't pretend that we know everything or that everything I'm going to say today is going to be um, still the same information, I would say, a year from now. Next slide. So, um, and again, I think you're going to hear from Sandra some additional information. I just want to put some um, frame around what I'm going to tell you about today. So on the right is in, in what I'm reporting is our study. So this includes nine individuals that we've done the following. Um, we've reviewed your genetic test reports to make sure that the result was in fact correctly interpreted. Um, we've gone through to collect information from you from a medical history interview. In some cases, we've reviewed and verified the medical records, um, and then we're putting it all back, putting it all together. In addition to that, um, and this is some of what Sandra's been working on, in the literature, there are additional cases. And so there is some overlap in some cases between people we've reported on um, and some others that you'll find if you pull the papers. Um, eventually, when we put all of this together, we will make sure that we don't what I call double dip. That is, that we don't overcount the same person multiple times. 
uh, because we don't want to make the mistake of saying something's more common than it is um, by doing so. And so what's been great for you guys is to help us to make sure that we knew if you had a child in one of the studies that your which studies your child was in and where we counted these. Um, again, one of the things that I want to emphasize, particularly about the work that I'm going to share today, is that the oldest individual in our series is still not even yet an adult. Um, so they're still young, they're still a long ways to go uh, going forward. Um, Sandra, I think, has had greater success in terms of looking at some older individuals, uh, but to me, one of the biggest questions for us going forward are what are the challenges as our children age up and become adults and how do we best take care of them? And what can we do now to ensure that they're going to be uh, the happiest, healthiest adults later on? And so I do think that's a big gap in our knowledge that we need to continue filling. It's tough because um, just because we haven't identified them doesn't mean they're out there. Um, I think largely what it means is they're not accessing the same type of genetic testing or part of some of the same research studies whereby your family's got a diagnosis. And so um, we can talk about it sometimes. That's a, a big issue for the community that we're trying, as a community, trying to deal with and get those adults diagnosed. Next slide. Um, within this, I do want to give you just a very brief primer on the different types of genetic changes or mutations, um, because there are differences and they probably do act slightly differently. I'm not going to go in great detail, except to say that the first three categories uh, what we call a premature stop or a stop gain, a frame shift. Um, those two, for sure, we think of basically um, the disrupting the gene or not allowing that one copy of the gene to work. Um, remember that for all of us, we have two copies of our fit gene. And in all of your families, there is a change in only one of those two copies. So there's one copy that's completely intact, that's working completely normally, but that second copy has a genetic change. And again, for many of you, um, it might be a disruptive change, what we call a stop gain, a frame shift. A splicing, I won't get into a lot of detail, but it may not be quite as severe. There are certain cases in which it may not be 100% or affecting 100% of that copy of the gene. So that may be a little bit weaker, if you will. And then for a missense change, it changes just one amino acid or one building block in the protein. And I don't know that those are all sort of as severe as what we see with some of the stop gain or the frame shift. So I don't care so much that you understand all the details about this, but simply to appreciate that they're not all exactly the same. And that may account for some of the differences that we see in our family members. Next slide. Um, so as uh, I'm showing you this, I'm showing you on the left what we know from the literature in terms of all the different types of change in FIP that we see across individuals. And you'll see that we have about a third of those that are stop gain, about a third that are frame shift, and then about a third that are the others. And so again, I'll show you some more of the detail, um, but there are some differences. Now, what I'm going to show you today in detail for the nine individuals that I'm telling you about, again, most of them fall into the category of the frame shift or the stop gain, um, but we do have two missense and a splice. There's one other point that I wanted to make, which is that in many of your families, this genetic change started with the child with FIP. So the terminology we use is that we say it's de novo, or it started brand new. That means it was not inherited from either you or your partner. Um, and usually in families like that, it won't happen again. That is that those parents will not have another child that also has FIP. Um, on the other hand, you'll see that there are, um, and Kirsten, maybe you can point this out on the bottom right, um, there are in our study one case where it was inherited in total when we look out there, five cases in which the FIP was inherited and for those individuals, for those specific families, it's a very different story. Those families will actually have a 50-50 chance of passing it on. And for those of you who have children with FIP, if they have children, it's a 50-50 chance of passing it on. Um, there, I know this was one of the questions that came up with the families. There are ways if that is, is your situation where your child is, you know, could at some point maybe have children and pass it on. There are ways to avoid that. Um, they don't have to require or include abortion within that. There are ways of being able to use what we call in vitro fertilization, 
um, and make sure that we simply don't get the young lady pregnant uh, with an embryo that would have SIP. And if it's a question that people want to ask about at the end, I'm glad to spend more time talking about that. Um, but the main thing is that to know about it in advance because there is certain planning that needs to be done. Okay, next slide. Um, so with this, this is now a diagram that I know is kind of complicated, but it's a diagram that shows all the different changes that we've seen in SIP. Um, Kristen took everything from our study, from what's reported in the literature, and we divided this up so that on the top are the missense changes, the one that changed single amino acids, so they're shown in these little blue sticks. Below the gene figure uh, with the purple bars are shown all of these that we think of as being disrupting the gene or uh, frame shift or premature termination. Um, it's not that I care that you worry or think about the exact address of where all of these are, but just simply that you know. Um, we also showed in bold, so a little bit thicker font, you can see all of the different changes of the individuals in the study I'll tell you about today, so those nine individuals. And then there are a couple blue dots which represent some of the variants that are inherited of the families where we've seen that change being transmitted. Um, so again, you can see that they're scattered all throughout the gene, largely. Um, there may be a little bit more in certain areas of the gene, but to a large extent, they're scattered throughout the gene. Um, and that's not surprising for the disrupting changes, but it may make a difference for some of these missense changes. And so again, if you fall in that category, um, there may be certain differences. Again, the reason I show you that everyone is different is because really within the community at this point, every single person is different. Um, we're not seeing a pile up or we're not seeing the same gene over and over again. And so it does pose a little bit of challenge in terms of comparing across individuals. But as I, I think you'll see, there are many things that are the same, but there are differences. And to a certain extent, that may be because the FIP itself is the genetic change in FIP is different. Okay, next slide. So now I'm going to get into probably what you care much more about. Um, so this first part, you know, was your biology or genetics 101, now is a sort of everyday life. Um, and so this is, again, reflecting back. I hope this is, you feel that this is accurate. If it's not, I'm sure you'll let us know. Um, again, what we've divided out in all of these slides is a column on the right that shows the data from our study, and then a column um, that shows what we've seen in the literature, where the data were available. Um, the data weren't available for every single one of these, so there are some gaps in our knowledge. Um, what I'm showing you is that when we looked at developmentally, uh, when the children, for instance, learned to walk and talk, um, they were basically consistently delayed in reaching, reaching all of those milestones. Um, but for the basic milestones we as pediatricians watched, they did eventually make it, but it took a little bit longer. So as many of you can see, the average age at which they sat without support was about 10 months of age. Um, in our study, about 12 months of age in the literature, when they started walking independently, um, almost two years of age, a little plus, a little minus between our study and the literature. And in terms of when they first learned to speak, again, in our study, it was about two years of age within what was reported in the literature, about three years of age. Um, so there's some variability. Again, we've shown you the range. So for instance, in sitting, there were some, one, some children that sat younger, you know, earlier, six months, some a little bit later, 12 months. So in all of those cases, you can see the range of when those happened. But importantly, I think uh, the issue is that those milestones came. They came about, they needed a little bit more work, they needed some help and support, but, but they happened. Next slide. Can I just add one one thing to that? Um, this is Kirsten. Uh, so the literature results might look like they're a lot later, especially the speech delay, than the ones that, from our study. But the ones from our study include everyone, including people that had normal milestones, as well as people that had delayed milestones. But mostly in the literature, people only report the delayed ones. So that's why it, might, it seems, especially for speech delay, that it's quite so much later. Thanks, Kirsten. Great. Um, so one of the other things that we did uh, that you'll remember is Kirsten or increasingly Laura Lamb, uh, uh, rather Laura Ham, um, has been doing an, uh, an assessment with you called a Vineland Developmental Assessment. Um, it's meant to get a, a feel for whether the everyday day-to-day -day life in terms of adaptive living skills, uh, how folks are doing in terms of that. 
And so we're showing you back their standardized measures for this or standardized scores for average. Um, and again, average is 50%. So you'll be able to see in terms of the range where folks are falling. Um, we divide those into different categories. So the, you'll remember we asked you a whole bunch of questions about how your child was able to do lots of different things. Um, and then we break those into different types of skills. So communication skills, daily living skills, socialization or interacting with other people, as well as motor or movement. So things like walking, running, jumping, things like that. So what you can see for this is that, again, if average um, in the population uh, compared to that, um, the kiddos are a little bit lower than average. Um, so not surprisingly, they're having challenges, um, but there are areas where they're having a little bit more challenge. And in particular, socialization seems to be the area where they're having the greatest challenges um, across that. Um, with that socialization, what I mean by that, and it's a very important skill because it has to do a lot with day-to-day -day how you you know, get by, how you interact with people, so how you can talk with people, how you can be able to uh, not lose your cool, how you can be able to handle, you know, some frustration certainly that can happen, um, but all of that in terms of just how you fit into a community ends up being real important. Um, on the other hand, you can see that the kiddos were actually better when it came to some motor skills, um, so they had um, greater or less problems, less challenges when it came to some of the um, just being able to move and coordinate, dance, um, you know, things like that. Um, so there's a range, um, and as you can see, that range goes from some of our kiddos are absolutely doing great. Um, they're right up in the normal range in terms of things, um, but others that are having, you know, much more, much bigger challenges. And again, some of this is because, um, although this is a single condition, there's variability within the group. Next slide. Um, with this, we also thought about behavioral issues, and it seems to me um, that most of the, that where it's consistent is all the children or all the individuals are having problems in terms of the brain. That seems to be the area that's most consistent and, and likely most impacted. Um, what I mean by that then is that um, they may have trouble in terms of being able to process information and be able to learn. There are learning challenges with that. Um, and they're also having some challenges when it comes to behaviors that can sometimes get in their way. And I know many of the children uh, either have had um, behavioral therapies or uh, special education in classrooms and educators that help with this. Um, and as you'll see in a little bit, some have used medications that have been helpful. Um, and the behaviors are not necessarily all the same or all the same throughout life. Um, I think these actually change and, and can be more challenging at particular times of life. Um, again, the top line, this is in our study, and um, you'll see that there are different types of diagnoses. Um, Almost everyone had something on this list, and I know you can't tell it from looking at this, but several people had more than one diagnosis. They had more than one challenge. Um, but those diagnoses were, for instance, that about two-thirds of individuals had autism or autism spectrum disorder, or at least behaviors that were autistic-like. So even if they didn't have an official diagnosis, they had autism features. Um, another one that was common was problems with attending or attention. Um, so attention deficit disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, or just generally problems by being distracted uh, was an issue. And of course, this can be an issue in terms of an educational environment. Um, difficulties with focusing can be, be challenging. Um, another was within anxiety or depression. And as many of you, I think, are very familiar um, to the extent that we can make things predictable and constant um, so that there aren't so many new things coming up helps in terms of the anxiety. Um, and I personally think this is, um, the depression I think is can be challenging in the sense that many of our kiddos are very much aware of what's going on around them. Um, and sometimes that's a source of the depression. If they feel like they don't fit in, if they feel like um, they've been slighted in some way or they don't feel as if they have friends, um, that can be more challenging for them. And so I think that's something, especially as uh, folks are getting older, is something to be very just cognizant of and, and try and intervene when possible. Um, certain folks have had problems in terms of tantruming uh, or aggressive outbursts. Some of this can come with frustration. Uh, some can come um, just, I think, by being overwhelmed and having just being just sort of an overflow. Um, but that's something that can get um, you know, really can be disruptive, can lead to things like being expelled from school or other issues. 
Um, and so that is something that I know has been quite challenging. Um, in terms of sensory processing problems, again, folks can get overwhelmed if there's too much stimulation. Um, and I know many of you have dealt with that in terms of trying to just avoid certain situations, either in terms of going to specific places or being at certain events or being able to even dampen down some of the sensory input, um, but that can be an issue. Um, certain folks have had issues in terms of intellectual disability. So that means for me, in terms of an IQ score, um, literally having an IQ less than 70. I think the important point though is not everyone is intellectually disabled. So we actually have a third of our community that has uh, that's higher functioning in terms of that. Um, and even the ones who are intellectually disabled, I do think they're still extremely capable. Um, so one of the things I know some of you know that I say is, uh, be careful what you say and how you say it, um, because our kiddos absolutely understand this, absorb this information and take it to heart. Um, so I actually think um, part of it sometimes is they can't always express everything they know and they feel, but I think many of them are quite capable. Um, and then finally, in terms of impulse control, in our group about half of folks had difficulty with impulse control. And of course, you know, that can be a challenge um, just in terms of, um, you know, not being, being saying things out of turn or doing things uh, just sort of on the fly that, you know, later they appreciate what a challenge it caused. Um, but it's, it's understandable that with experience, this gets better. So again, as you'll see um, from the literature, some of those numbers are lower. Um, that was sometimes the case because I don't think they were necessarily probed. Um, sometimes they were, and it may just be that there are differences. So either around the world, who gets into studies, how they're diagnosed, what age they are. Um, so I do think there's still quite a bit to be learned from this. Um, next slide. Uh, can I just add as well, um, sure. one of the one of the things that came up here was that because people are coming from different countries, the sort of diagnostic criteria for some of these is different. So in terms of how we categorized it, if you're, you just you describe significant symptoms that went along with one of these things that seem like they were impairing your child's ability to function, then I categorize them within this group, even though maybe in one country that would be diagnosed versus maybe they hadn't gotten a diagnosis per se from, from a, a psychologist. So just for the purpose of categorizing them, that's how we did it. We're not sort of diagnosing your child or anything like that. It's more, more just yeah. to, it's for our purpose of categorizing. Thanks, Kristen. Okay, so getting on to some of the medical issues, um, I guess my take home message is that largely the children are healthy. So from a medical point of view, they've been relatively healthy. The one issue that um, I think we're still trying to sort out is the weight issues and the issues that might be related to diabetes later. Um, and I know this has been a concern for some of the families um, and it's variable. And so you'll see very pointedly there are differences between our study and the literature. Uh, the thing, one thing I want to point out is the age difference. So our uh, young people in our study are definitely much younger than what we're seeing in the literature overall. And so I don't know how much of this is going to change over time. That is that there might be certain periods in a life course that are more vulnerable to weight issues or there um, just may be differences around the world in terms of access to food and all sorts of things. Um, so there are differences, I guess, is the point that I'm making. I do want to make the point, though, that I don't think it's necessarily the case that everyone will have to be destined to be overweight. Um, so I do think there's opportunity to be able to um, find what might be something that would be helpful. And at this point, I don't have a magic bullet, I'll warn you, so I don't have anything where I can say, oh, you just take a certain medication and the weight all goes away. Um, right now, it's still the tough things in terms of um, being careful with diet, trying to be as physically active as possible. Um, certain medications may actually have the side effect of decreasing appetite, um, and that may be sort of an additional bonus in certain cases. I'm not saying that you prescribe medication specifically and solely for that, um, but some of the ones that do treat behavioral challenges can have that side effect. Um, it is hard in terms of once you gain weight to lose the weight over time. Um, so it's prevention as much as we can do for prevention um, is something that, that we should try and strive for. Um, I will say that not, I'm not going to present the data today, but we are working on some medications specifically that will target uh, certain genetic forms of obesity. 
SIP is not one of those that is indicated right now for the medication that we're using, um, but just to say there may be hope on the way because we are a, a different part of my group actually worked specifically on this issue. And so um, just keep that in mind. The other part about the weight is not just the weight itself, although the weight does have issues in terms of some orthopedic issues or mobility issues, um, but the greater concern for me is future risk of diabetes or heart disease or potentially cancer. And so that's a large part of why we're trying to get this under control. Um, we do worry that this gene in particular may have effects on the pancreas that produces insulin, which is what's related to diabetes. So I do think or I worry that there's a higher predisposition to diabetes than just for the average person that might be at the same weight. Um, so I, this is not based on fact at this point, but it's based on conjecture uh, for what we know about the gene. And so that is one of the things we're trying to follow very, very carefully. Um, again, there are medications for diabetes, so it's not the absolute end of the world, but once you have diabetes, it can cause other problems with heart disease and um, other, other health issues as well. So we wanna try and minimize that if we can. Um, what was very consistent, and again, I think it was because uh, we probed for it, that's why we see it more than in the literature, um, but hypotonia or low muscle tone clearly, um, and not surprisingly, very commonly what we see with children with developmental delay. Um, but I would say beyond just the low muscle tone, um, many of you reported problems with fatiguing or getting tired, um, and that seemed to be to me, more than what I see on average with children with the same degree of hypotonia or low muscle tone. And so um, I am, you know, I, I do think this is a little bit different than what we see with some of the other conditions, um, but it's gonna, we're gonna need to continue to dig down in this a little bit more. But uh, because of that, I don't think it's just your child. Um, just for those of you who are wondering about this, this seems to be something that's seen across many of the children. Um, eye problems, and it's shown on the right are some of these issues that Kristen is pointing out. Eye problems uh, were not terrible to me in the sense that it wasn't permanent blindness, it wasn't problems like um, irreversible eye damage, um, but the main message for me is that there were some visual problems, and when learning, uh, you need to be able to take in the world around you through your eyes, through your ears, through your vision, through your hearing. And so it's important just to make sure that this gets evaluated by a pediatric or an adult ophthalmologist, make sure if there are either glasses or surgery that needs to be done, um, that this is done. To me, these are all very readily treatable vision problems. Um, beyond that, we did see, I, I'd say, a modest number, but some infections. I'd don't think that there's a primary immunodeficiency, so I don't think that there's um, a terrible problem with the immune system, but I often hear that um, these are folks that just seem to take longer to get over a cold or ear infection or whatever's going around at school. It seems like they come home with it and it takes longer to get rid of it. Um, and I do think it makes it harder in terms of, you know, you're just down and you don't feel great and it makes it harder to learn. Um, so my message to this is as much as we can, Immunizations, your flu vaccine every year is a good thing. Um, you know, Purell is a good thing, uh, but we can't prevent all infections, so we do the best we can. Um, a couple other things that we saw that I do think are related to the brain are sleeping issues. It was a, not, you know, everyone, it was only about a third, um, but sleeping issues, and sleep is when you're consolidating what you're learning during the day. It's very, very important actually for uh, education and being able to learn and being able to move forward. Um, so that's one of the reasons I bring it out is, and there are ways of being able to treat this. Um, there can be issues with obstructive sleep apnea, which is not just a brain problem, but it's actually some of what accompanies when weight gets to be an issue. Um, so it's one of the other things to look at. And if you start to notice that uh, your child is falling asleep during the day, they seem to be excessively drowsy and nodding off, um, it's probably a good sign that they're not getting enough sleep at night. And there are ways of doing specifically sleep studies to try and pinpoint where the problem is and, and what treatment is good. So one thing to keep an eye on. Um, and then finally, seizures or epilepsy. Again, not everyone for sure has this issue, um, but I do worry that if people are having seizures and if they're not treated well, um, this can be problematic and also cause learning issues. And there's a very simple way doing an EEG or an electroencephalogram to be able to evaluate this. So again, um, this can come in terms of what we call absent seizures, where just look a like a child is staring off into nothing, they're kind of out of it, 
Um, so if your teacher is reporting that, if you're noticing that, there's also daydreaming. So, you know, admittedly, not just every time someone stares off is it a seizure. Um, but if you see something you're worried about, what I often tell people is take a videotape of it. If you can with your smartphone, take a video of it, show it to your child's pediatrician, neurologist. Um, and if they need to, they can do one of these things where they put the electrodes on the head and do an EEG. Okay, next slide. Um, I'd just like to add for the uh, recurrent infections, I think uh, for some children when they were before they were able to talk or really express themselves, it seems like perhaps some children have a higher pain tolerance than maybe um, other children in, that don't have this mutation would have. And so some of these infections went on for longer than might have been noticed otherwise. So I think it's important to sort of be vigilant, especially if a child does seem to have a lot of these infections. Very good. I see Isabella joined us. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, so with this, there are also some other issues that can come about, and, and really I think the gastrointestinal system is the biggest one, um, but as I was mentioning before, there can be endocrinological problems. Um, these can fall in the area of diabetes, issues with growth, issues with thyroid disease or hypothyroidism, um, especially the hypothyroidism can be treated, um, so that's something that you, know, you don't want your doctor to miss. Um, the gastrointestinal problems, I think, are fairly common. Again, not quite 100%, but constipation is one of the challenging ones. Um, things tend to be slow in the gut, um, just like there's low muscle tone. It's also like there's low GI tone is what it feels like to me. Um, some of these can be especially challenging when they're little, um, and to a certain extent, they may change over the life course. Um, there are various ways, as I think many of you have already figured out yourselves in terms of treating the constipation, whether it's diet, dietary supplements, medications, um, sort of a regular bowel hygiene, if you will, I'm just getting things to regular patterns. Um, but for some of you, I know it's been a big, big, big issue. Um, and so uh, I don't pretend that I have a magic way of getting rid of this, but um, it is common. And, and part of what I know you're good at each other with sharing information is coming up with hopefully practical solutions. Next slide. Um, we're getting towards the end, uh, but one of the things that I think some of you have noticed, either if you've compared literally pictures uh, with each other, is that there are some um, bodily differences, so some facial differences that you can see, um, some things that we see in terms of the hands or the feet. There can be what we call curvature or um, Clinodactyly of the fifth finger, it's just a little bit curved, doesn't cause any problems in terms of being able to play an instrument or type on the keyboard. Um, but there can be some, uh, like I said, subtle differences. There can be webbing between the second and third toes, but it doesn't cause any problems. Um, there can be some issues that might be a little bit more challenging. So I know in particular a couple of uh, the kiddos have had hypermobility, so some of the joints that may be more extensible, and it just makes it even harder with some of the hypotonia to do some of the physical activities. Um, I don't know that this is uh, debilitating, but I know it has been challenging. Um, and then, as we said, some of the facial features, some of the, the differences that we can see in the faces. Um, the, the children, at least all of the ones that I've met or seen pictures of are gorgeous, um, so I don't think it's anything you need to worry about. Um, but if you ever notice that they might look a little bit for different from you or from their other parents, um, that's some of the, the reasons why. Next slide. Okay. So um, this is something that I hope we can eventually get even better at. Um, I put the list of types of medications. I didn't go down and list every single one of the medications, but if it's helpful to the community, I'm glad to provide that level of detail. Um, the main reason why I put this down is because usually to use a medication, a condition has to be sort of serious enough that a family said, okay, we're to the point where we want to use something to try and treat it. Um, so this is just showing the different areas that I mentioned before, getting to the point of now actually trying something for it. Um, this included also not just medications, but diets, you know, so if people tried to use either in terms of something like a low calorie diet because of the, the obesity issue, or in some cases a gluten free diet, um, that's how that's listed. So as you can see, um, thankfully, not everyone needed to have medication. In fact, very few people, for instance, needed medication for seizures. Um, and part of this, as I said, may be that at different stages in life, different things come up. And so I know it's hard to appreciate this um, just from this cross-section, 
But to me, what was stood out is that, for instance, it was common for people to take medication for ADHD or for uh, attention issues. Um, again, one of the things we can talk about either on this call or some other things are, do we have something as a community that feels like it's working better than anything else? So far, I haven't heard of the magic bullet, but I'm interested. Um, similarly, when it came to constipation, again, frequently people were needing to take a laxative or some other medication for constipation, suggesting to me that it was significant enough um, that, you know, people were doing something about it. But those are the main types of issues or, you know, either behavioral issues with the psychiatric medications, attention, uh, depressive medications, but, you know, things that were related to the brain and behavior, um, and then constipation largely. So I think that's where we're seeing, like I said, uh, some of this coming to bear. And I hope this is one of the areas where we can get more information to try and, you know, um, provide better useful information to you all, what works and what doesn't work. Um, but right now, I, I don't think we have a magic bullet. Next slide. Okay, so just to wrap this up, and, and I'm going to turn it over to Sandra, turn it over to you in just a second. Um, but we definitely see in summary that really it's mostly the brain, the mind, the behavior, the mental health that I would say is an area where we're focusing. Um, medically, the good news is, again, so far, um, not terrible things and things I think we can try and get ahead of the curve. As much as you can um, with your educational strategies, also behavioral uh, interventions are helpful. So it's not all about medication, but educational strategies that work that are more effective. Uh, behavioral interventions that work and more effective. I think that's also part of what we can learn from each other. Okay, I think that's, maybe we have just one more slide and then we'll switch it over to Sandra. Maybe we'll switch here, Kirsten, and then we can come back to questions at the end. So Sandra, I think what we're gonna do is I'll mute myself and then we're gonna unmute you or you can unmute yourself and then we're gonna share, you, we'll let you put your screen up if that's okay. Um. So can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Um, That's good. Sorry, let me just figure out how to get out of my PowerPoint. Um, okay. Um, Sandra, when you go to the bottom of your screen, does it say, does it have an option for you to share? Yeah, share screen, so I'll try that. Okay. Oh, it says uh, I cannot start sh uh, sharing while the other participant is sharing. Oh, okay. Hold so on. I think you still have to close it, maybe? Yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll try. Um, I think... This would be, yeah. Okay, I think you see the right screen, right? My first slide with the title, is that correct? Do you see it? Okay. So, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, say thanks to uh, Dr. Chung uh, for reaching out uh, to us and to Bert de Vries, one of my supervisors, um, to um, yeah, be able to share some of our uh, things of our study and also meet with uh, you, with the families and, uh, the, and your group, of course. So thank you very much for that. Um, actually, of course, you already uh, used our data and included the rest of the data. So I think uh, I can well, summarize it a little bit more than I uh, prepared because otherwise I would, uh, yeah, you know, do it over again. And that's not very uh, interesting for you all. So uh, I'll just see um, what was uh, what's interesting. Uh, but first of all, I would like and then. OK, let me. S um, Yes, there it is. I would like to introduce our team because, um, well, we haven't met before and maybe uh, uh, some of our colleagues do recognize uh, these faces, but also for the families uh, that are joining. Um, Alex Hoysen is one of the colleagues that uh, did the, um, uh, the, 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 well, the molecular part of the study. Um, he's a molecular geneticist. Uh, this is me. I'm a, a clinical geneticist in training and uh, have been working on the clinical part of the study. Uh, Lisenka Vissers is one of the supervisors and she's also joining this uh, meeting. 
Uh, and Evan Eichler and Bert de Vries are also uh, two of the supervisors of the study. Uh, Evan Eichler is uh, from um, uh, Seattle and uh, Bert de Vries, and you mentioned him, uh, he's also from Nijmegen, uh, the Netherlands. Um, so we have all been working on this study and, um, and are more or less uh, still involved in, uh, in the FIP study. And um, well, I, I, I started uh, my presentation uh, by showing you this girl and you already mentioned her uh, very shortly because she was um, mentioned in a report in 2012 and she was actually uh, the first individual with a mutation in this gene uh, that was reported in literature. And um, she uh, encountered some neonatal feeding problems and also some uh, motor and speech delay. Uh, eventually, she had severe intellectual disability uh, behavior problems, uh, which are actually the ones that you already mentioned that would be found in other patients later on, had uh, eye uh, problems. And um, well, this was the girl, is the girl, as you see here, this is a picture of uh, some years ago already. And uh, as Dr. Chung uh, already said, is uh, as clinical geneticists, we uh, look very uh, detailed uh, to patients. So there is not a very, you know, a specific, there's not something very odd or strange about this girl, but we look uh, very detailed. And then we see some things that uh, I will later on show that we see uh, in more uh, individuals. Uh, and we also had a look at her fingers and toes, and there we see that she has uh, tapered fingers, as we call it. So it's more a little bit more broad here than at the tip of the finger. And what we also saw is a little bit um, uh, that the skin is a little bit longer between the second and third uh, toe. And she also uh, had obesity. So this was uh, actually the reason that um, well, we found a mutation. So this was a truncating mutation uh, in this girl, in this gene. And this was actually the reason that, um, and I will move on for this because you already told it, that would be uh, double. And that was actually the reason that uh, we put uh, the gene uh, in our uh, list of genes of interest that we wanted to sequence, so investigate in a large cohort of patients with intellectual disability. Um, so we did that in more than 3,000 individuals, and we did this with a um, special assay, and I will, won't go, go into detail uh, in, uh, with this, but this is a molecular inversion probe, and we focus on uh, de novo mutations um, uh, because uh, we know that if we find mutations in the child and not in the parents, there's, it's more likely to be causative in uh, children with intellectual disability. And we combine the data with a database that's publicly available. Uh, uh, and uh, then we found that 11 of these genes were genes of, uh, that were in, indeed um, causative for intellectual disability. And one of these was indeed FIP. So then we went on, as you also did, of course, um, uh, to found, find uh, more uh, individuals with a mutation. And, and this, these are pictures, and I've included a picture of your report because, as I said, there's not something, well, particular about um, uh, our uh, patient group. But if you uh, look very closely, you see that they are very uh, large eyebrows, uh, their nose is a little bit upturned, and if we have a look at uh, their, uh, the side of the faces, then we see that the, uh, the ears are a little bit large. So that's something that's very minor, but we do see it in several patients. Um, and there is uh, your girl again. Well, we also had a look at uh, the hands and the feet, and that, that was also mentioned already, uh, that we see uh, tapering fingers, and sometimes this is called a syndactyly between the second and third toes. Uh, we also looked at the clinical report, but I think that would be, again, a little bit uh, the same, and you already did it 
uh, great by combining um, all the data that was reported in literature, so I won't go into detail. Um, the thing that I was thinking about is uh, that I would like to mention is also the fatigue because um, that was something that is really reported by the patients to me. And then afterwards, I asked other parents and they were also um, confirming that this was in, and indeed, I, I agree more than we hear uh, of other patients with a developmental delay or intellectual disability. So this is indeed something uh, that we know. And um, yes, that's, I think, the main uh, thing to say about this. The uh, type of mutations and the different forms, it's also already um, reported. Uh, so our conclusion uh, was um, that uh, the mutations in this gene uh, that are mainly causing uh, a defect in the gene, so that one of the copies is not working properly, um, is indeed causing the syndrome. Um, so um, we have been working on uh, some, or actually I think two projects, and uh, one of these is uh, facial recognition. We are doing this more broadly, not only for the FIP gene, um, but what this is, is uh, that you look with a computer to photographs of patients. And uh, we are doing that because, of course, if we are looking at a patient, then um, it's very subjective and we want to use not only molecular um, analysis uh, and uh, ways of looking at a mutation, but we also want to use other uh, possibilities to say something about whether a mutation is causative or not. So that's the reason that we are working on this. And um, what facial recognition does is uh, looking at uh, well, points of the face. And can you see my cursor also? Or yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, it's uh, looking at uh, points of the face and um, measures the distance between it and then uh, combines that data. So that's also what we did and we used two different types of looking at that. That's not very important for now. And we also uh, matched it to a control population of individuals with uh, developmental delay. And what we then saw is that um, the individuals with a mutation in FIP are uh, depicted in blue, that they are more grouped together. So uh, the, they are more, they look more alike than they do compared to the other, uh, the control population. And Dr. Chung also mentioned that there are uh, some uh, individuals with a mutation, with a missense mutation, of which it's more. Um, we are not that sure often that it's uh, also positive, so we wanted to uh, investigate whether we can, you know, um, use this tool to um, show it's causative. And we were able to do that for one of these two uh, individuals. Um, so we show that um, in this case, the individual uh, with uh, A uh, next to it is in, uh, indeed looking more uh, uh, as the other individuals with a mutation in FIP than um, the other control patients. So that's, I think, interesting, and maybe we, you know, we want to use that more in the future uh, as one of the tools to use and to uh, be sure or if it, that it's more likely that the, the mutation is causative. Um, and one of the other things uh, that we worked on, and uh, that is maybe interesting because you already collected so much data, and uh, we want to um, use um, that um, to combine it on a, uh, on a website, and it's a gene-specific website. We have several of them. It's a, a platform that's called Human Disease Genes Website Series, and uh, we are working on a, a FIP website, um, where clinician, uh, clinicians can um, uh, uh, add data of their pair, uh, patients uh, and then show it immediately. Uh, so I think that's very interesting. And I also wanted to mention a, a project um, that is started by uh, Jean-Louis Mandel, a French uh, colleague, and that we are also working with. That um, that's this uh, website, and I can uh, well, I you I can provide the website in another way if you want. Um, this is a website uh, on which uh, uh, parents and caregivers can uh, include information. And so the um, 
um, uh, the questions that they use are more details because we know that uh, parents are very um, uh, well very helpful and uh, really want to um, provide as much information as uh, uh, which can be uh, of interest of other parents so that's one of the things that this website does and they are also a platform for many genes but it would be an option maybe to uh, use this if you would like uh, to show the data for a FIP um, but that's an option of course that's not something um, uh, obligatory um, and as said this is more detailed so um, that's actually I think what I wanted to say. Um, so this might be of interest also uh, to you, Dr. Chen and Kirsten, uh, to think together maybe at another time uh, to discuss whether we can do something uh, with this uh, or not. <laughs> but uh, that would be something for another time, I think, yes. So that's what I uh, wanted to show. And uh, thank you again. That's great. Thank you so much, Sandra. And, and definitely we can talk offline about how to be able to, again, get the information out to as many people as possible. Um, so Sandra reminded me as she was showing uh, pictures and talking about the ways of doing facial recognition, um, just for the families, at least in the U.S. that we've worked with. Um, I know some of you have had concerns about sharing things like photos of your children or being concerned about privacy issues. Um, if you do want to support something like what Sandra's done, I think there are probably multiple ways that we can do this, and Sandra and I can talk offline to make sure of this, yeah. um, but there might be ways of being able to use your photos without having them publicly released, um, so, you know, maintaining privacy issues, but still powering this ability to do better facial recognition. Um, and for those of you who may, may feel comfortable actually publishing, um, so in a medical journal publishing, facial pictures, either front on or profile pictures of your children. Um, there are ways of being able to do that with the goal ultimately of ensuring that more people get diagnosed and that we can understand this condition better. So yes. we'll, we can talk offline sort of family by family, but if, if people feel uh, after watching Sandra's presentation that they'd like to contribute to that, we'll figure out a way to make that happen. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Sandra. So I just, um, Kirsten, I'm not sure if this is the way we set this up. I just lost my video connection. I oh. know this is the end of the, maybe that was just me. I think it shouldn't be, yeah, um, it, should, it, should, it should be okay. Okay, okay. So um, I can't see everyone's beautiful face, um, but anyway, I'm just gonna open it up now to see if there are questions. And there's a chat function at the bottom where you can type in a question or I think everyone has the ability to unmute themselves and then chime in with a question. Um, at least I'll be glad to stay on for a few minutes for questions that people have. Sandra may or may not be able to. Um, and then once we're finished with any questions from the group, we'll be glad to drop off ourselves so you can talk amongst yourselves without having us eavesdrop. Hi, I have a question. So has there been any correlation found between the gene and small genital size or anything like that? I, I personally have not seen anything. I don't know, Kristen or Sandra, if you've seen anything. Um, I saw that there were a few cases of undescended testicles or, or testicles that kind of Descended later, but I hadn't. I haven't seen anything specifically about size. I don't know, Sandra, if you want to introduce. No, I haven't seen anything like that. I agree. Yeah. No. Okay. Thank you. Kristen, am I okay to ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Actually, I've got a couple. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chung and Dr. Jansen and, and uh, Kirsten. You've all been terrific, so I really appreciate your time and everything you're doing. Um, so I'm very pragmatic when it comes to looking for um, treatment for, uh, for this condition for, for my daughter. And so we know that the issue is within FIP, and we know that different mutations are going to have different um, outcomes within FIP. 
how much work has been done already in your teams in terms of mapping out the pathway between the various mutations to see sort of relative to a normal fit functioning where things are going wrong like is that um is that something that's uh near term that we could find out about or is that something that is still a ways away it would just be great to get a sense of timeline in terms of the cell study so I'll, I'll speak at least for what I know is going on and uh, Dr. Jansen can add anything. So I would say it's a still a ways off. Um, it's challenging with any what I'll call ultra rare disorder to be able to do this. I think the good news is that for, I don't know, let's say 80% or so of, of as you've seen, I think we would model them similarly in terms of loss of function. And then the sense at this point, I think we would probably keep in a separate category. Um, without going into too much detail, and Adrian, I know you thought a lot about this and worked a lot on this. Um, you know, there are ways of being able to develop cell lines um, directly from the patients or to engineer them to be able to study each of the different types of changes and get some better sense of, of what's going on. Um, I think ultimately there are sort of different strategies that people think of to do this. Um, and it's everything from trying to think about uh, how do you take care of the symptoms once they present to how do you think of medications to increase the amount of FIP that's coming from the normal gene that's there. Um, you know, how do you sort of tweak that part of it to, you know, some people are even thinking, I'm not going to pretend that we're at this point for this condition, but even thinking about um, sort of adding genes back, gene replacement, gene therapy, those types of strategies. I think that's a ways off right now for us. Um, but I do think, uh, to me, there are some fundamental things that one can do in terms of either having um, in vitro or cell-based models to do things, as well as some uh, very clever ways of making mouse models where you can flip the mutation on and off to be able to see if there are developmentally how much of this is sort of pre uh, done already at the time of birth or within the first couple of years, um, and how much you can continue to have an impact uh, throughout the rest of life. So I'd say to me, those are some of the sort of fundamental things that need to be done. I personally have not done any of those studies, so I, I'll just speak for myself. Um, but I think there are ways of doing this. I think part of what the community waits for is to know how big an issue it is. And Dr. Jansen's study, I think, has been tremendously important to realize that this is not just, you know, a one in 10 million disease. It's probably much more common than we realize. We just haven't been testing for it long enough. And, and one of the reasons I was asking um, is that, uh, so I'm, I'm in Canada and, uh, and in Ontario, we actually have a, a group of researchers that are working together um, on ASD and looking at various different mutations. And so in talking to um, one of the researchers, one of the things that they're interested in doing is, um, I'm sure you're fully familiar with it, but using biotin tagging to try and figure out the pathway of the various mutations. Uh, in different ASD um, causes. And so in talking to them, they might be interested in, in looking at, at FIB. Um, and so I'm, I'm just having some conversations with them just because we're in, it's, it's like uh, anybody in Ontario can be part of this. It's, it's a government sort of paid um, uh, system. So I, I just wanted to know what it is that you've done or you're planning on doing just to make sure there isn't necessarily duplication, but that's something that um, that we may get an opportunity to do. That's great. So I, I don't, I mean, I'm just speaking for myself personally. Um, I think part of what I've been waiting to do is, like I said, see exactly how large a condition this was, be able yeah. to see what the mutation spectrum was. And I absolutely have no problems facilitating, catalyzing anyone else's research. I'm not going to, you know, claim that this is something that we have any exclusive rights or interest on. So if there's right. anyone in any way who has interest that any of the families are connecting with, we'll be glad to coordinate support. Um, certainly if there's any data or cells or specimens that the families donate, I'm happy to you know, share those more broadly so the families only have to do things one time and can you know, have multiple people be able to benefit from it. That would be wonderful. So maybe I'll talk to our, um, our researcher and, um, and, and see if there's anything that could be beneficial in that way. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure.
So I have a question. I know that with my daughter, um, we have the low muscle tone, but we're seeing that she has low muscle tone throughout. Um, they, when they took her tonsils and adenoids out, that they discovered that even the muscles in her throat are very weak and obst actually obstruct her breathing. And I know that we, we've discussed it with them and our next step would be um, reconstruction surgery for her. I was wondering if anybody else has seen that as well. Uh, so I'm not seeing any nods or thumbs up yet. No, we, we have Person? I, I can say uh, no one that I spoke to had mentioned anything along along the lines of that. Um, I'm not sure. I know that there there might be sort of like multiple genetic possibilities going on um, with with some families, and so I'm not sure for your specific case. I don't know whether that's necessarily fib related or, or some or something else related. right yeah and that's what we were thinking too that it's probably more along the lines of the eds but we are just we're unsure because we haven't talked to any of the other families to see if they have any issues like that yeah yeah of course hi can you hear me um marie from the uk yeah. Um, my daughter um, had a lot of issues with swallow. She used to poke a lot. Um, so possibly, again, to do with muscle tone. Um, she did have her tonsils out when she was much younger. Um, as she's got older, she's now 20, so she's one of the older in the group. Um, that has slowly got better. Um, but as I say, from the age of about four up until about the age of 15, she did used to choke a lot on her food and they put that down to muscle tone. So yeah, pretty similar, I think. Okay. Yeah, it's one thing with Isabella, I know um, we had a, we have to do feeding therapy with her because she has the choking and they believe it's just the muscle tones in the mouth and the throat are just really weak. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I guess, sorry, let me, let me just clarify what I said earlier. So a lot of families did report difficulties with feeding, particularly with baby. Hi, Isabella. Um, <laughs> and that that was something that was a pretty a pretty common experience. Uh, I more so meant that I hadn't heard of anyone else reporting the having the surgery and then having the muscle tone within the, what they took out to be problematic. But definitely problems feeding as a child, particularly as a baby, sort of like the sucking, um, all those muscles that that was quite common. As was having difficulties with regurgitation, particularly when kids were young. Jackson has problems. He had his tonsils and adenoids out and had had severe ear infections that we never knew about because he was young and they said he had a high pain tolerance. But he still, well, he's 12 and he will choke on food and he has a hard time swallowing drinks sometimes and he still sucks his thumb too. So he's got muscle tone stuff going on in there, but they've never mentioned surgery to me either. Yo, what's going on? You're gonna say hi? Yeah. <laughs> no, let's see my day of the Okay, any other questions out there? Um, uh, my daughter's 20 and she's just been diagnosed with polycystic ovaries. Obviously, you're, the group's a bit young to, to be having this show, but I was just wondering if that's anything that's um, shown in the older girls, polycystic syndrome. We've had a lot of tested for PCOS and she does not have it, although she is pretty hairy. Uh, she she did not test for polycystic ovary ovarian syndrome, but we do have her on birth control. Okay. Um, also, my daughter has just uh, showed up positive blood clotting disorders. I wonder if anyone else has shown up for that, or that might be something separate from from it. But, uh, we have not tested 
her blood for any clotting no, no, no. disorders. So it's something I might um, talk Hi. to endocrinology about and see if they want testing done. So but yeah, we haven't seen any sort of issues with clotting. Clotting problems wasn't something that I saw reported commonly. Now, again, of course, the sample is small, so it's not to say that that's not possible, but just in terms of what we've seen thus far, it wasn't something that I've seen a lot of. I'm less sure about the PCOS. I don't know, uh, Sandra, if you, uh, since you've had some older patients, if you know exactly. Um, I don't. I don't remember anything about that. No, I just uh, checked because I couldn't remember it, but no, it's not mentioned. So the PCOS is not mentioned and also not a clotting uh, disorder as far as I know. Yeah, so no other just thing. One com just one small comment to make. I'm, I have not heard of this association either, but um, just the, ask your doctor if there is a clotting disorder, uh, oral contraceptives or the pill are not always a good medication to take. So that combination can actually exacerbate clotting problems. So just, you might want to check into that with your doctor. Do any of the doctors recommend gene site testing for medications at this point? Do you, do you, what do you think about gene site testing? Because we've, We've, several of us have had it done on our children to see how the liver metabolizes the medications like ADHD and SSRIs and things. Do you find that it would be useful for our children to have that type of testing? So let me just, um, Elisa, for those that don't understand this, um, there are some genetic tests which are very different than the genetic tests that diagnose the FIP in your children that are what they call pharmacogenetics um, that are related to for drugs, either which medication to use or how much to use it based on how your body metabolizes, metabolizes and breaks down those genes. In my experience, they haven't made a tremendous difference. Um, I'd say it's a still an area that's emerging. Psychiatrists are ones that would like it to really be better than it is right now. Um, I don't think it hurts, but I, I haven't seen it been remarkably helpful. Could I quickly try to add to that? I'm not really sure whether you can hear me. Yes. Uh, we've recently done a pharmacogenetic essay, or at least a survey, in a population to see how many individuals, just healthy individuals, would be carrier of such a variant that would suggest that you would use a different type of uh, level of your uh, metabolic of your medicine because of your metabolic rates and 70 percent of the population so seven zero carries a variant that well would require amending your dose of uh, medication so everyone is carrier of such variants so it's yes it's helpful but i agree with dr chong um it might not be as good um, in this scenario but it wouldn't hurt either to, t to try. Right, we've just, we've found that she metabolizes medication very differently than other children do, especially the stimulant medication. It's very hit or miss, so. Yeah, and it, it might be definitely worth trying, but then you might, um, the experience might be that, she, that it's a very different type of metabolic disorder than the typical ones that you would test for in a routine test. So then you would actually request a very specific essay if you would like to test it. Yeah. And then I've got another one. Those of you that have the older um, kids with the G mutation, are you guys seeing that they still they're relying more on the parents or any of them independent? Marie. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Emily's 20 and I would say, I've got another, I've got another daughter who's older and there's, there is a difference to be fair. Um, she would, she's still heavily reliant on me at 20. Um, she, she is becoming more independent, um, but, for me, socially, it's a difficult one. She doesn't have that friendship group, whereas my other daughter would, they would go out, they would socialize. That's a difficulty. I'm still having to pick her up, drop her off. I mean, that's tonight now. She, she would have joined this, but unfortunately, she's in uh, college doing a show. So um, but I will still have to drop her off, pick her up. So 
I would say at 20, I would compare her to my other daughter at about 14. Mm -hmm. So I would say she's probably maturity wise, still a, sort of a mid teen in that sense. So um, although we're working on it, it's, um, yeah. I think you have to be brave. I think you do when they get to their teens and um, <laughs> it's difficult and we become very protective of them, you know, uh, ferociously so I think. Um, but I think the more, the more you can get them involved, looking back now, I probably wish I got her involved a bit more and let go a little bit more. And I think by doing that, it will, it will reap, um, you know, dividends in the long run um, when they get that little bit more mature. But I do, I do think that Emily will mm -hmm. at some point become more independent and, and it's very, very slow, but we're getting there. We are getting there. And she's at university and she's doing a degree course. So, you know, mm -hmm. with help, but they're doing it. So there is hope. Does she have a lot of, um, help though like does, does she have a, uh, someone who helps her with uh, her work she the has university? yeah yeah she does she has what's called a mentor and she will sit with her two hours a week and she'll do the coursework with her but because she's doing a um inclusive theater course a lot of the um work is done through acting through um you know, uh, singing etc and the coursework she will get um help with um but you know at Day. It's, it's good for her. It's um, she's getting out there. She's at, she's at a university. She's mixing it with other children, uh, young people, and on paper, she, at the end of it, she will have a degree. But she, yes, yeah, she is getting a lot of support. Um, something I think as a parent as well. Sometimes it's you know with everything else, it's very very difficult to sit down and do degree coursework with them. So you, you do need to accept you know the outside help as well, which you know I'm grateful for. But uh, hopefully, I mean, this time in six months' time, Emily will be um, looking to find work, and she's already got doing a bit of voluntary work, working with kids with special needs, and she has already been offered a part-time job working in the school with children with special needs. So, you know, so that's that's a good thing too. And then. Um Toileting. Has anybody seen a significance? I know for Isabella, her constipation is pretty severe, so she actually has a tube that goes into her cecum, and we have to flush it with um, Miralax and water solution. And then she gets another um, medication through her G tube, so we can hit it at both ends. But it's been the hardest just trying to get her to go to the bathroom. She says she doesn't always feel it, especially with urination. I know my Emily's had problems with urination. In fact, we've got a urology appointment tomorrow, but exactly the same thing. Even to this day, she'll sometimes say, I actually don't feel it. Um, thank, thank goodness we haven't had the issue with constipation. In fact, we've had the opposite. We've had a lot of issues with diarrhea um over the years um but uh, the urination is a, is still a problem lots and lots of urinary tract infections and the, the sense as exactly as you say i don't always feel that i can go i've kind of been putting that down to muscle tone as well both with constipation perhaps diarrhea and with the urination that they don't have that same feeling that that we take for granted so that over the years what i put it down to um, and again, with a bit of exercise, I think it's helped. Um, I try and get Emily to do the sort of pelvic floor type exercises. It's helped a bit, but to be honest, it's even to this day still a bit of an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think what I'm going to do is ask all of the professionals to get off the line if it's okay. Um, I wanted to give you guys some private time and I didn't mean to in interfere with that. Um, so I see out there several of us. Um, we're going to keep the line open. Um, we'll stop recording at this point and, uh, you know, take up the line is open until, um, well, for the next 40 minutes or so. And um, if there's anyone who felt that this was useful and you'd like to do this again at some point, let us know. You can send us a line by email. 
um, we're glad to continue supporting the community however it's helpful. So it was great to see everyone. Um, actually seeing your faces means a lot to us. So thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to say um, before logging off to give everyone an update on where we are with publication for those of you that are um, involved in the, the study that is going to be uh, be published. Um, we're almost done with writing and we're just putting, putting all the final data together. Um, if I will send out an email if I'm still missing any data from you, there's a couple people that have sort of one or two small loose ends that I still need. So um, look out for that in the next day or two. And if you have any, yeah, as Dr. Chung said, any, any questions or thoughts or thought this was helpful or thought there was other things we could do, um, please let us know. I will be um, not as actively working on the project from here on out because I'm, I'm starting to, uh, go to work in the hospital soon at, as a medical student. So I'm um, sort of moving into the next stage, but it's been such a pleasure working with you all. And I greatly enjoyed getting to know you and um, getting to hear about your kids. And it's great to see all your faces now. So thank you so much. It's been such a privilege to work with you all. Thanks. And if you have the link for the presentation that was recorded, we'll put it up on the uh, the Facebook group so that everyone can see it. Okay. Yeah. I have to. Um, I, I need to talk to the technology person to figure out how to do that, but we will get it out to everyone. Thank you. Right. And so I'm. Goodbye. I'm goodbye, everybody. <laughs> goodbye. I want to goodbye, just say the goodbye. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. I'm just going to leave my, my computer open because it's sort of technically hosting the meeting, but I'm going to stop the recording now and then I'll come and shut it actually down in, a, in 40 minutes or so. Okay. Okay.